WeWork bankruptcy. Climate change is driving up insurance rates. The investment climate for 2024. The big guys are excited. Hello and welcome to the CRE News Hour, a weekly podcast at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time each and every single Wednesday. We come to you live to discuss current events and everything commercial real estate. My name is Henry Eisenstein, and I'm lucky to be here with my co-host, Rafael Colazzo. How are you doing, my friend? Doing well, man. Can't complain. It's a beautiful Wednesday here in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm sure it's you know beautiful in Miami as well. So uh, It's a little cloudy. Oh, okay. But, <laughs> but us- typically, let, let's just say most of the time, I'm sure you're having a great time. Today, we we, uh, on the show, we will be discussing everything from WeWork bankruptcy, tan- transfer tax voting, the investment climate for 2024, uh, shocking multifamily development statistics, and so much more. Raphael, where do you want to start things off today? Let's go ahead and pull up one of my articles to start, and then we'll just go back and forth, kind of like what we did last time. So as I'm pulling up this article, uh, feel free, guys, uh, continue to type away in the chat box. We're looking forward to hearing your guys' engagement uh, throughout this uh, conversation. Absolutely. And, and again, if you guys enjoy this type of content, please give us a thumbs up and like it where you are watching us. Absolutely. So next up uh, is going to be an article that I found. Again, I'm focused primarily on the retail side. Um, so, you know, I've been following along different retail news. This particular article focuses on the counterintuitiveness of the fact that brick and mortar retail has been really doing extremely well in a post pandemic world. Uh, so it really focuses on, you know, the outlook for retail REITs. And so, you know, within this article, it kind of talks a little bit about, so for example, mall giant Simon reported a net profit of $594 million in the third quarter, a 10% increase over the same period last year, uh, while the, its occupancy rose from 94.5% in Q3 up to 95.2%, which is not insignificant when you consider the, the, the number of square feet that they have under in their portfolio. Uh, same with Kimco, a very large shopping center owner as well. They saw a big jump in net income, net profit as well. And again, I mean, you start seeing some news about some of these other retailers like the Bed Bath and Beyonds that that went out of filed for bankruptcy and some of the big box stores that have been struggling. But for the most part, uh, you know, uh, brick and mortar retail is still resilient. And although retail footprints have, be- have shrunk over time, the price per square foot these, that these real retailers are willing to pay, especially if the location is phenomenal, it's still an extremely strong market. So, you know, I just thought I'd share this article. What are your thoughts, Henry? Yeah, I mean, um, Love this article. I think that brings a lot of truth in the sense where in regards to what type of asset class to be focusing on, this is a retail has been crushing it. I think it's one of the the top asset classes in just about every market around the country. Retail has been kicking some butt. So again, if you're not in the retail sector, I think it's uh, this is another reminder to realize like, hey, maybe it's time to diversify the types of asset classes you're looking at. Take some time to study up on the retail side, focus a little bit on finding good investment opportunities because there is a lot of buyers out there in the retail world. I know there's a lot of um, a lot of buyers out in Jersey and Miami where we're at. So uh, you know, it's definitely a strong asset class to be focused on. And uh, actually, I think that it's doing um, better in some areas than it does shocking yeah. enough. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, it, it depends on the, the market, but yeah, there's certain parts of town and I'm sure it's, you know, like you said, in, in Miami, I'm sure there's certain sections of town, maybe South Beach. I don't I don't know Miami as well as you do. Maybe, you know, there's a certain pocket of, of town where that is, you know, obviously the, the primary uh, or the, the most profitable enterprise to, to pursue. So next up, uh, one of Henry's articles, we thought we'd, we'd talk a little bit about Brookfield Asset Management CEO C signs 2024 could be good for property investments. So. Yeah, I wanted to bring this up because similar to what you were just mentioning in regards mm-hmm. to the retail REITs, I think this is also something that we can allow us to breathe easy, right? Like mm-hmm. these investors, these huge, big time, I mean, this Brookfield is one of the largest investment firms on the planet. And they they have a very, very optimistic outlook for 2024. That makes me happy. That makes me sleep easy at night, knowing that the big guys are like excited to be chomping at the bits for opportunities and deals in 2024, because I mean, that that's, that's our main purpose, right? So it makes me breathe easy felt, felt like I um, at least should share some good news when we see it. What's your take on this? Yeah, I think it's great. I mean, and, and obviously these guys are market drivers. These guys are going to be, you know, uh, taking advantage of the situation. As you've mentioned many, many times and all the things that you've said, you know, you, you, you've you got to play the cards you're dealt. And even though the, the environment as we currently sit may seem kind of tumultuous, th- these are the big guys. They're saying they're chopping at the bit. They're ready to go. They're right, ready to take advantage of these types of opportunities. And, you know, if you're diversified in the right sectors, you know, again, you can still navigate through these tumultuous waters and come out of the other side uh, stronger than ever. And so, you know, I'm sure this is kind of the running theme that we've kind of talked about on several of these different uh, webinars is that even though the situation may seem, especially with all the news headlines and everything in the media, like everything is is kind of in flux, the big guys are excited. And so we can kind of take solace in that fact 
and understand that, you know, we have an opportunity to kind of leverage that optimism as well. So absolutely. Yeah. And I think this is something that we can uh, start knowing deep down that, hey, if you want to be successful, you need to be aligning with the, the, the investors that are excited about the current market. Regardless of 2024, what's happening, right? I feel like the most success I've seen personally has been from partnering up with investors throughout my career that are excited about the landscape of today. It might be a little bit hairy, right? It might, it might be a little bit touch and go depending on where you're looking, but you want to be aligned with people who are buying stuff today. People who are on the sidelines and haven't bought something in the last 12 months, they're probably not going to buy for the next 12. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just co being cognizant of like, hey, like there are a lot of investors like Brookfield out there, maybe not the size and maybe you know a little bit smaller in size that uh, that we, the average everyday commercial brokers can be taking advantage of and partnering and aligning with to start seeing some massive success throughout our careers in today's day and like right now. To keep Absolutely. That in mind. Absolutely. So next up is an article that I, you know, biz now, if you guys haven't checked out one of the best mediums out there to, to gather commercial real estate news. Uh, one of the things that I found kind of interesting is the real estate transfer tax heads to the voting booth, setting up major battles. So this is obviously specific to Chicago itself, but this is a, a type of policy that you know likely will spread to other cities outside of just Chicago. Obviously, Chicago is one of the largest cities in, in the country. So if you see something happening in one of these large metro areas, it's probably not a huge leap to think that it's going to that it's going to trickle into other markets as well. So the premise of the transfer tax is when you were to sell a property, what they're proposing is that there is a 0.6% drop off. Um, I'm sorry, there, there's a drop off in the amount of tax that you would actually pay on a sale of less than a million dollars, but that rate would increase for those who sold property for a larger than a million dollars. And then there's different tiers. So between a million and a million five, you know, there'd be more of an increase. And then after a million five, you'd have, you know, another increase as far as the rate's concerned. In this case, it would be quadrupling what the current rate is. Obviously, that affects very, you know, higher income and, and higher wealth families as well. Their premise is to be able to utilize some of this money to then go out there and provide additional services to the community. I'm not sure, you know, obviously there's speculation about what this is actually going to actually cause to happen. And and I thought it'd be a good discussion point. I know this is always sure. a, a, yeah, I know. mean, um, I, I think this is a, a BS tactic. I think mm -hmm. transfer taxes is a load of crap. Um, I, I think that like, it's just another, another grab at money before you go. It's like, you know, we always make a joke about people who leave New Jersey cause it's so freaking common that they slap you, you know, slap you on the ass on the way out, you know, just uh, as a, as a nice goodbye, here's an extra fee. We know you're going to leave us. So we got to charge you money for it. We got to tax you to, to get out. We got to tax you while you're here, you know, a crazy amount of money and tax you when you leave. So it's just, I think it's a ridiculous statement. I think transfer taxes should always be trying to be fought to be lower, not increased. So I think it's just kind of an, you know. It's a terrible yeah. thing that they're trying to do in these states. Yeah, I think I think it's, you know, they it's funny here because they say and it, it's estimated that it'll bring in an additional $100 million in revenue. But what they often don't tell you is like, because obviously this is just one tax that's being levied against, you know, people that, that fall in these different categories. But I'm sure there's other legislation out there that is continuing to tax them at a higher rate as well. So at a certain point, kind of like what you're seeing in New York City, I'm assuming in New Jersey, it's probably similar is people are just going to get fed up and say, you know what, I'm a high income tax earner. You know, I, I'm an investor. I have a lot of money, whatever, whatever that is and I'm just going to relocate to another state. That's where you're seeing a lot of people relocating to Miami. You're seeing a lot of people relocate to Tennessee. You're seeing a lot of exporting of, of individuals from those different markets that, quite frankly, are just heavily taxed. Although on paper, it may seem like you're, able, you're going to be able to generate more tax revenue. I don't know if that's going to be the intended effect long term. I would prefer to see something that would incentivize like a development, for example, and then obviously generate property tax from that. Because obviously, if you increase the value of a property, you, know, you can assess a higher value to that property, thus collect more property taxes. And that's what a lot of these no income tax states are doing is that they don't levy a state tax, but then they go ahead and make that up on the property tax side, which yeah, I think is way brilliant. smarter. Way yeah, smarter. I think, I think that's a better approach when it came when it comes to levying these types of taxes. So absolutely. I think that uh transfer tax is just a you know a BS money grab from the government. And I think that they need to be able to figure out their own uh their own finances and in the, the current budgets that they have and stop trying to ask the you know the everyday average individual for for more money. Go to a developer and say, like, listen, like, you know, allow me to build more apartments. I mean, love I would love to pay more taxes. You know, absolutely. Um, I think that's a, a way better way to generate billions of dollars in tax revenue is to give the, the opportunity for more housing which is absolutely needed anyways in these areas. Yeah, and that's one of the things that, you know, I, I talked to Bob Knackle on a podcast of mine. He's a big broker in, out of New York City. And one of the biggest hurdles that New York City is facing is the affordable housing crisis. But when it comes to developing new product in New York City, it's one of the hardest markets to do that because of all the rent control and whatever else. So it's it becomes a, a very contentious issue where it's like, I can't deliver the product because it's not economically feasible to do that. But then you guys are trying to say something different. So I digress.
(laughs) (laughs) On on to the next uh, topic. So this is one of Henry's articles. Uh, U.S. layoffs decline, construction spending rises, jobless claims edge higher. I just wanted to bring this up a little bit just because I think it's important to pay attention to a few key things in the average everyday markets of today where this is another reason why so many people are getting to the sales world. It's like you're, there are so many people who are getting laid off in today's economy because of how rocky things are out there. Because most companies in the Fortune uh, Fortune 500, the S&P 500, they're not doing well. I mean, it's it's only doing, you know, decent right now in the economy because FANG, right? Or, the, you know, FANGA at this point, or FANGA and with an N now with NVIDIA. I think that it's um it's kind of crazy where it's like, this is a huge reason as to get, get your own business going. Like become a real estate agent, become an investor, start your own business because the, the amount of layoffs that I see is ridiculous. Ridiculous. These are top performing salespeople, top performers in the corporate world. I mean, obviously, a lot of people who also are kind of just skating by. But I think this is a good, you know, a, a good reminder to be like, hey, you know, this is a good time to start start a business in these types of. A lot of very successful companies are started in recessions. That was one point. And the second point was the construction spending. I think that there's a lot of opportunity in regards to development, and I, I'm actually quite pleased to see that construction spending is rising because hopefully we're going to be getting some decent development. Even though in some areas of Jersey, like Jersey City, as an example, right across the Hudson from Manhattan is drastically overdeveloped. I think Miami, Miami is so overdeveloped in the you know Southeast here, um, greater Miami area. It's just ridiculous how much availability they have. So I wish they had this kind of development spending in uh, in a little bit better er- or in areas that are actually needed. Yeah, I think it was obviously just optimism and there's a lot of people that are moving to Florida. So there's a lot of speculation that it was involved in in the development. And, and to, to be honest went, with you, I, nuts. I'm sure. And you were mentioning when we were the other day, we had one of the articles that referenced like the housing you know situation and you had referred to some of the newer construction apartments that you had in Miami and there's just all these new buildings and now you have a lot of people trying to compete with each other to attract the the people to come into the apartment so I'm sure that's only going to continue to compound as new product continues to be delivered in that market but yeah. Um, I mean, look again, this is uh, just to go back to the entrepreneur side of this, like, mm-hmm. let this be a freaking reminder, people, like if you're in the corporate world, this is a huge reminder as easy as get a license for a few hundred dollars or a few thousand per year, a few hundred dollars to start a few thousand per year, become a commercial broker, get into the game. I mean, like, this is a what you stop allowing other people to dictate your financial future, get into the game here. Cause I mean, look at, look at, I mean, look at the, the job creation, look at the job losses. It's just ridiculous. And the crazy thing is too, you look at the concentration of actual job losses, 25% is in technology. And historically, you see people who are engineers, and I come from an engineering background, you know, I was in software development. So historically, you hear people say, oh, yeah, like, you know, you'll always have job security, everyone always needs developers, everyone always needs these types of technical roles. But when the economy is shifting, people are looking at the bottom line, and you become a number when it comes to these large corporations. So you know, there's no such thing in job as job security, in my in my opinion. So the only way that you can assure that you will always have a profitable uh, enterprise is to start one for yourself and and really hustle and create something that's worthwhile long term. Next up is an article I found. Uh, CNBC also has phenomenal commercial real estate content. Uh, One of the articles that I found interesting, and I'm sure you guys, you're dealing with this a lot in your market, Henry, is climate change is driving up insurance rates and forcing developers to add weatherproofing. Obviously, in a lot of these other markets, and I believe this particular market was in Maui. I mean, you could see the devastation of just the fires that happened over there. I mean, it's unbelievable. So it's sad. terrible. And so, you know, what what's what's often ends up happening is that insurance companies, they may lose initially, but they're going to recoup that money somehow. And so what we're starting to see is with all these natural disasters that have occurred over the last several years, and we've had several pretty big ones. I know in Florida, there were several big ones uh, you know, pertaining to hurricanes and flooding here in, in the middle of the country. There's been a lot of tornadoes that have caused a lot of damage. There's been fires on uh, California, Arizona area. And then obviously the Hawaii fires as well. So, you know, with all these losses that these these insurance companies are, are having to incur, this is obviously going to pass along to the consumer. And that's what we're starting to see on the investment front. And so you're, I mean, I know plenty of property owners just in our market that got a 20 or 30% insurance increase with all their different properties that they own. And that could be a crippling development for someone in particular, if they haven't budgeted that into their, you know, pro forma, you know, I'm I'm sure this is going to be something that's going to affect a lot of investors that have invested over the last couple of years, especially on the syndication front, just kind of wanted to share that, that additional information pertaining to this topic. Uh, Henry, do you have anything you'd like to to add to this? Yeah. I mean, I think that this is, I mean, honestly, it's ridiculous. Like, what the insurance companies are doing is absolutely asinine, in my opinion. I think it's absolutely ridiculous to be charging the types of rates that they're charging. I think they um, got away with murder with a lot of different things. And not only are they trying to raise rates, which they, I mean, not trying, they are drastically raising rates. 
they are also they are in the business of not paying. That's what the insurance game is, right? It's just like how can we find a loophole to show and or prove that what you're actually insuring wasn't the case of what the issue was. Essentially, they're in the game of not paying, and uh, it's it's kind of ridiculous what these insurance companies are doing. It's about time that they're getting shellacked a little bit because they've been taking advantage of the average consumer for a long time. I mean. Florida has been decimated with insurance prices. It's insanity how much money they're paying. That's if they can, if they're lucky Just enough they to get, get insurance. It. Yeah, exactly. I've heard of many insurers that don't don't even touch Florida anymore. They don't want to insure in it. And same thing with Florida for I mean uh, 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 California for the fires, right? Same mm. thing with now Hawaii because of the fire issues. It's just are you kidding me? In this article, shoot, they referenced a, a lady who was looking to try to get insurance for the multiple different multifamily buildings that she owns in Miami Gardens, and in order to meet the new lending requirements to refund finance, the lender was trying to require her to get coverage of up to $40 mil- $47 million. And there was no insurance firms out there that will- felt comfortable insuring for more than $10 million. So she was kind of stuck. She's like, what am I going to do? You know, the banks require me to do this and there's no lender to- or there's no insurance company that's willing to provide me with that type of coverage. And so, yeah, I mean, it's just a rough situation for a lot of people. The biggest challenge of all this is that there's really, there, there's not a lot of other ways to spin this. There just isn't. The only, like the real only ways that as a commercial broker, we can find opportunity in these moments moments is I, in my opinion, love to get your two cents on this is either an investor is going to pay cash, which I just think is silly, by the way. I, I'm a huge fan of leverage and the right, right kind of leverage. But in these types of instances, you're either paying cash, you're going to get seller financing where the debt, there is actually no debt on the building, essentially. It's just personally held by the seller where the seller holds a note and they're not going to require you know, the, the type of insurance that a bank's going to require. So you can uh, skate around the uh, ridiculousness of how much money you're going to have to have in coverage. Like in this instance with this woman, you probably can get a seller financing situation if if she was going to buy it as an example. Like I would love to, if she had no debt, I'd love to buy it off of her as an example. And she's not going to require $50 million worth of insurance, more likely than not. You're going to do that. And the other side of the opportunity here is expansion, expansion of uh, geographic location. If you're a broker in Florida, you, you maybe start learning how to do out of state deals, right? And try to expand. Like, this is the opportunity to start looking into different areas to, and locations. We are not seeing this type of discrepancy in insurance. 100%. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think it'll eventually taper off, not necessarily taper off, because again, I think once some premiums start to rise, they kind of level out at some point and they usually level out higher than where they were before, but it will level out at some point point and, and I'm hopeful that these types of you know issues we've been having on the, the the disaster front is somewhat of an anomaly I mean if you look at historically how everything's been going I mean it does seem to be kind of out of the norm so hopefully going forward we we find ourselves right. in a position where we kind of normalize and and at that point I, I think they're gonna have to yeah they're gonna freaking have to eventually I mean I think it's like rates I mean obviously rates are gonna have to come down I mean like I, but who knows how long it's gonna take and how much damage will be done in the meantime you Absolutely. know financial damage by the way if you guys are tuning in you guys will please please drop some comments what are your thoughts about the insurance land landscape of a couple of different states here, like the Hawaii's, the Florida's, the California's, even the coastal areas of Texas, where they're having major issues in regards to flooding. I'm curious mm-hmm. to get your two cents. What do you think about what, what do you think is going to happen in the insurance world? And by the way, you can drop any questions or articles down in the description or down in the comment section down below. We're going to be responding to everything in just a little bit. And I'm pulling the, trying to pull this up right now, but it's not, uh, doesn't seem to be, let's see if I can maybe. Uh, is this one of my articles? Yeah, it's one of your articles um, uh, in the meantime. Nice. I know. So I, I think this is one of the, uh, anyways, I'll talk about this, this is the multifamily yeah, one. Talk about it, yeah. Yeah, so this is uh, multifamily construction starts are down 60% in quarter three of 2023. I mean, this is just something that I thought was so interesting to me where the development world is starting to slow down. I mean, I know you can't pull it up. You can just throw it in front of us. The uh, multifamily right now, again, construction starts are down 60% in quarter three. I think that this is something, let's see if I can just read off the news article from perspective here. One sec. This is something that like we were just talking about on the development side. I think that this is interesting where people are finally starting to get the idea that like certain areas you just don't need as much. Now I'll read this off real quick. Commercial real estate direct staffing report construction on only 57,000 apartment units got underway in the third quarter, according to the Cushman Wakefield, which is down 60% year over year, which is insane to think about. I think that what's interesting here is that I think development's just an ever-changing landscape. And I feel like for the right areas, like we were kind of alluding to about the the South Florida's or Jersey City in, in New Jersey, I think that this is finally... Um, a lot of people are realizing, especially because of how high interest rates are, the floating rate debt, it is very difficult to be profitable in the development world right now. Again, I think also, as, as you alluded to, I mean, banks have to feel comfortable loaning out for these construction loans. And right now with all the, the tumultuousness of the current environment, a lot of lenders just are not too antsy to start loaning out for new construction projects. In particular, in the multifamily space where there has been a huge run up on you know different rental 
rates and, and prices around the country. And we're starting to see a tapering off of that. So when you're presenting pro formas to these different lenders to say, hey, you know, you know, the interest rates have gone up and my mortgage payments have gone up and my insurance costs have gone up and construction costs still are relatively high. But yeah, we want to build this property. And oh, by the way, we're projecting a 10% increase in rental rates over the next three to five years. Lenders are just questioning that theory and saying, well, no, I don't, I don't think that that's actually going to be feasible. And unless you're a developer that has the dry powder in order to make satisfy the covenants of these types of, of loans, then obviously you just decide to sit on your hands for a little while to see how everything plays out. So I don't necessarily blame developers for holding holding on and trying to see wh where, where the market shakes out because uh, you definitely don't, don't want to get caught out in front of your skis. So I think that exactly what you're saying is 100% spot on. I think that the interest rates and the banks, because of the tightening, I think that if you're in the world of development right now, like you're having to find so much meat on the bone for mm -hmm. a development opportunity these days that you just got to be really careful, right? I think if, you're, if your specific business right now is focused on development, like if you're a broker who focuses on development deals and like that's your that's your bread and butter. I think this is a, another opportunity to realize like, hey, development's really freaking difficult right now. Office is really freaking difficult right now. You need to be paying attention to a couple other options right now. Absolutely. So this may get a little of discussion, I'm sure. Uh, obviously, it's somewhat political, but not necessarily fully political. But the, the premise is that the White House has come out with a new action to create more affordable housing by converting commercial properties to residential uses. So they recently released a blog by the, the, the Council of Economic uh, Advisors to kind of push for what they're determining to be a, a certain allocation of funds towards trying to create incentives and and potentially even help with you know the acquisition and conversion of some of these different properties and so you know obviously you can kind of read through this you know it's it's somewhat pretty it's pretty comprehensive as far as the things that they're discussing but I thought I'd just kind of open it up I mean a lot of the things that they're proposing in here you know there's some of the programs have already existed more so they're just trying to refund some of those items the, the issue that I see a lot with with the conversion of these commercial properties into residential use is most of the properties that they want to convert, which are these office structures, they're not designed really to be multifamily properties. I mean, the way that the floor plates are, are constructed, you know, the way that all these different mechanisms within the properties are, are, are situated, it was strictly for an office use. So when you cut, when it comes to actually developing or redeveloping these structures into structures that can actually support these residential uses, you start talking about some serious money and whether or not that's actually worthwhile versus just, just demolishing the building and going ground up, that's the, the question mark. I don't know how what you think about this or, you know, I'm sure you have uh, things to say. Yeah, I think that it's interesting where <laughs> a lot of residential agents, like this is what it makes me think of, right? It's like a lot of these residential agents who come up with these deals where they're like, oh, well, there's so much opportunity in this thing. It's like, if you bought an office building right now, 40,000 square foot office building with a major vacancy, say it's even 100% vacant, do you understand the cost, how much yeah. it costs to convert into a multifamily building to have it operate as such? I mean, you're talking about almost just as much essentially as developing it from ground up, like you had mentioned, you're having to find these opportunities that are at such steals price per square foot wise, because you're probably going to spend upwards of almost $200 a foot in some areas. I mean, especially in Jersey with the, how much things cost. Nonetheless, Miami or these other areas, right? There is just not as much opportunity, I believe, in finding these office buildings and converting them. You know what I've actually been, we've been looking into? We've been looking into conversions of offices to self-storage facilities. That's a good one. That's a good idea. I mean, there, and, and even one thing that I know one of the local agents here kind of brought up, which I thought, thought was a brilliant, potentially a brilliant idea is, you know, some of these like daycares and nursing homes, there's a variety of different uses like that that obviously are a huge need, but there's, you know, there's just not as many locations. So if you could centralize many of those into one building, that could also kind of be repurposed. And you obviously, all you really have to do at that point, again, they're individual floor plates. So if you have enough of a support system to just take on, you know, the floor plate as it stands, I mean, then you could literally operate your business on site and there wouldn't be much reconfiguration or reorientation of the space. So that that could be a great idea. And there are some buildings out there that, that are candidates for conversion, but they're few and far between. And, you know, obviously a lot of these cities don't want to hear that it's probably a better idea just to knock down the building and start from scratch because then you, you have, you know, the perception that we're going backwards. But in reality, sometimes you have to take a step back in order to take a few steps forward. So hopefully we don't put ourselves in a position where we misallocate funds, which I'm sure is probably going to end up happening as we're going to, as, you know. as always. <laughs> yeah. I think that, yeah, look, the, the redevelopment world, I think is a huge opportunity. I think you just have to think smart. You have to think you can't be looking at something like, I love looking at something and saying, what's the highest and best use here, but going like looking at an office building and immediately going, this will be a great multifamily property. And then trying to pay, like you just sometimes can't pay anywhere near where they're being offered at, which is why we talk about the investment world and dressing 
basically, you know, making the super low ball offers. But I think that this is just something to pay attention to going into the future. Like, hey, how can I squeeze the juice, squeeze the lemon here of this property? Like, how do I get the most upside out of this deal? I don't know if office is the right option for uh, <laughs> residential housing, but I guess we'll see as the future comes. Next up is Henry's article. I, I'm excited to kind of dive into this one. It's kind of breaking news as we you know, kind of read this out. Uh, WeWork has officially filed for bankruptcy, kind of a foregone conclusion that that was something they were going to do, but you know, it is now official. Um, and so as part of their bankruptcy proceedings, they're attempting to, you know, dump, you know, 40 office leases. I've seen some estimates as high as, you know, 60. I think they have a hundred total that they're trying to, you know, they have on the books or whatever that is, but it's not going to be good for these property owners that have their properties leased out to uh, WeWork. Uh, to say the least. So, yeah, I mean, listen, I think that we all knew this day was coming. All right. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I think it's funny that a lot of people are thinking that like this is like such crazy news, right? Like, I think we knew this day was coming years ago before it even went public. I think that we knew that this day was coming just because, again, their uh, operationals, their financials and operational standpoints, I think that it was just not an overall great company. I'm even shocked that the IPO did what, the, what it did. It was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I think at this point in time, it's this is a a really cool indication of how things in life work. This type of company, just like many companies, they didn't work out of profit. They worked out of basically pure ego. They grew way too fast and there was no profit behind it. And it's not anything shocking that now they're having, they're, they're having impossible times trying to restructure where this is something to look at for opportunity as a commercial broker and saying, hey, there's a lot of, this is Manhattan, by the way. This is 40 just, 40 just in just in Manhattan, correct? Yeah, just in Manhattan, where there's a couple huge WeWork locations here in Miami, Miami, obviously, and they're packed to the brim. I mean, there's a ton of people in them. I've been in them, and it's interesting where they expanded way too fast in these areas. Where if you're in Manhattan right now, I think this is a huge opportunity for you to come in and maybe even make offers on some of these huge office buildings. To uh, these would be good ones to redevelop, right? Like the huge Manhattan office buildings for redevelopment. I mean, obviously you have to get really good deals, but when you have a place where they're losing, you know, massive space. I mean, some. I mean, if I remember correctly, some of their spaces were like tens of thousands of square feet. I mean, if not hundreds of thousands of square feet, I think they have oh. several million square feet in Manhattan alone. I think, that the, yeah, the huge opportunity for redevelopment, huge opportunity. I mean, because Manhattan would be primed for it to oh, yeah. uh, actually do the, the redevelopment option. Yeah, if if you can kind of, not necessarily skirt, but if you if you can avoid the whole, because the, the problem with a lot of these redevelopment projects when it comes to housing in particular is that the rent control laws that are that are in place. And, and I don't claim to be an expert in that, but if it makes sense and you can bring it to market rate, then it could very well be a very good opportunity. Regarding uh, WeWork, they were valued at $47 billion. And when they filed for bankruptcy just recently, I think they're they valued just over $40 million. I mean, you're talking a cataclysmic fall from grace. I mean, it, I have to think it's probably one of the one of the worst falls from grace that I've ever seen. I, I don't think I've ever seen a company that was that high that then fell uh, from, from that far up. I mean, obviously, you've heard of FTX. You've heard of Theranos that was pretty much fraud. Um, but in this case, I mean, it was, a, it was a business model. It had a viable business model, but the whole premise of behind it and, and the amount of money that was being thrown at it without actually it being profitable is what ultimately led to its demise. And obviously there's a lot of things that happened that I know we talked about in the in the documentary that affected it as well. So yes, yeah, sick. I mean, what happened in this with this company? Absolutely sick. This is so fascinating to me that people again are, are so surprised. I mean, what's going to be even more interesting is when they try to IPO again, right? Because they're gonna they'll be back. I think they're gonna get delisted from the uh, New York Stock Exchange, right? Yeah, they have to. Uh, yeah. Right, they're gonna get delisted, and then I guarantee you they're gonna try to IPO again. So beware of you ever seeing this come back on the market. I don't think their financials will ever be as strong as they quote once were, which was actually still bullshit. So we'll see. If you're tuning in, if you're watching this, even after the live session, you can always drop your questions. We do review everything afterwards and we'll use those for actually some future content. So make sure you put some comments down below of any kind of like two cents or things that you maybe you learned or things that you don't agree with. Even I, I, I'd love to de debate some certain things with everyone here. So uh, we would appreciate you guys dropping in the chat.